John 1, 10 through 14. He was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to what which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his drilling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from Father, full of grace and truth. Linda was nervous about that. She did a great job. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> we love our holidays, don't we? We jump at any excuse we can get to get off of work or school just to celebrate something, whatever it might be. And one of our favorite things to do is to take the birth date of someone famous and make a holiday out of it. And I've always been intrigued as to why we do that. And what is so special about that day just because someone was born on that day? I mean, thousands of babies are born on any given day. Is, is one baby more significant than all the other babies who were born on that day because of just who he or she would, would turn out to be as an adult? It seems to me that if you're going to celebrate a day, that it should be a commemoration of the day that uh, that person did, whatever it was so great that we uh, name a holiday after him, rather than mark the day that he was just born as a little baby. Now, the birth date was no more special than any other day, except maybe for the baby's family. And that baby was no more special than any other baby, except to his own family. For example, it's easy to see why we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. I mean, that marks the time that he did what he came to do. That's when he defeated sin and death by taking our punishment on the cross and then rising from the dead to bring us the victory over death in the grave. You know that day is worthy of the greatest celebration that we can come up with. But why Christmas? Why do we make such a big deal about the birth of Christ? Now, wasn't he just another baby, just like thousands of other babies that were born on that same day? What was so important about that day? I mean, wasn't it more important about what he would turn out to be and what he would end up doing? Well, of course, the ministry and the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus were the climactic point of his life and the very purpose for his coming. But still, there was something very significant about that birth. There was something very significant about that baby. And even though we don't know actually what day Jesus was born on, it very likely was not December 25th, but whatever that day was, it was a very special day. That birth was a very unique event. That baby, even if he never even did grow up to minister in Israel and to die on the cross and to rise from the dead, that baby was a very special baby. So today we're going to look at why this is so. We're going to examine a very important doctrine of Scripture. John 1.14 is one verse that is just packed with rich theology. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The theological term that is used to describe this verse is the word incarnation. If you studied uh, Spanish or Latin, you might recognize that root word carne, often translated as meat or, or flesh. So incarnation simply refers to God becoming meat or flesh. This is a concept, although it's remarkable, it really isn't all that foreign to human thought. I mean, you've all heard of reincarnation. You know, that's a belief that is held by uh, Eastern religions, and a lot of people have, have entered into believing into something like that. And, and it's the thought that, that no one actually ever really dies. You know, we just keep becoming flesh. We come back in another life, as, uh, in another form of life, as another person or maybe an animal. If our body dies, then we are simply reincarnated. We come back with a different flesh. 
Uh, in Hinduism, the cow is considered sacred, and so the ultimate reward would be considered to be come back in the next life as a cow. You know, that would be the epitome of the divine in the form of flesh. Now, I admit there are some aspects to a cow's life that are kind of appealing, but all in all, I don't think that's really what I'm looking for. <laughs> and, and I'm not trying to make fun of people who believe in reincarnation, because actually at the root of their belief is, is a truth, that there's an awareness that there's got to be something beyond this life after we die. And the point of divine becoming flesh is not foreign to human thought. You know, the desire and the need for something like that happening is just built into our spiritual makeup. But the truth of scripture tells us that this is something that happened only once. The divine became flesh only once when Jesus was born and when God took the initiative. You know, that, that was the only way that it could happen. Even in pagan religions, this was acknowledged. Uh, I remember back in the Old Testament when the magicians and the sorcerers of Babylon in uh, Daniel's day were, were asked to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. They said only the gods could do that. Only the gods could do such a thing like that. And gods did not dwell with mortal flesh. So this whole concept had been considered, but it was just kind of passed off as being impossible. The only way that it could happen is if the divine took the initiative and made it happen miraculously. And while even pagan religions acknowledge this, they also long for it. They desire for God to become man. And that is, is something that is just built into just about every religious system that we have. Uh, once uh, when Paul and Barnabas had miraculously healed um, a lame man in the city of Lystra, as we read in Acts 14, the people shouted, the gods had become like men and have come down to us. Even though it was considered impossible, they wanted to believe so much that this is what had happened. And they started to call Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, which were the names of their gods. They, they wanted to offer sacrifices to them. And Paul and Barnabas had a hard time convincing the people that, no, they were just men and, and they wanted to preach them about the God who became man. Universally, we long to know God and realize that the only way that we can do that is if God chooses to reveal himself to us on our level. Well, Christmas commemorates the time that that happened and the only time it happened because it only needed to happen once. So John in his gospel, it, it's a Christmas story here in John 1, and he uses very unique language to describe this monumental event, this event that all of the Old Testament leads up to. And all of the New Testament is based upon. But the language that John uses helps us to give a proper understanding of what it was that took place in that stable that one night many years ago. In John's Christmas story, there isn't any mention of a baby. There's nothing said about a virgin mother or a star in the sky or angels or shepherds or wise men. But still, Jesus is clearly identified. He's identified as a single word. It is the word, word. <laughs> when God chose to speak to man, the word that he used was Jesus. Everything that we know and understand about Jesus is what God wants to say to us. And one thing that is very clear about this word, Jesus, is that he is divine. He is God. The first verses of this chapter, chapter 1 of John, leaves no doubt about this, and they provide the ultimate evidence of a divine being. So what do we know about the divinity of Jesus according to these verses? Let's read the first four verses of John 1, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. So what is it that we learn from these verses? First of all, the Word, which we know is Jesus. The Word was from the beginning. Jesus was pre-existent. That means that Jesus existed even before he was conceived in the womb of Mary. There was never a time when the Word did not exist. And so that alone makes him God, because what else can you say that about anybody or anything except God? And then we read that the Word was with God. So this means that there is some sort of distinction between the persons of the Trinity, but yet at the same time that Jesus was with God, 
He was God. Jesus is not less than God in any way. He is God. Third, we see that creation took place through the Word. The world could not have been created without him. Jesus is the creator of the universe because God is the creator of the universe and Jesus is God. And then last we see from verse 4, the word is the source of life. In him was life and that life was the light of men. Everything that has life is alive because of Jesus. All physical or spiritual life comes from Jesus. His life is the light of men. Only through Jesus can we see how to have real life, everlasting life. And so it is clear from the, the start of uh, this prologue of John's Gospel that the Word, which is Jesus, is divine. It's from heaven. It's God. And then the amazing truth of John 1.14 is what is impossible according to human capabilities. This Word became flesh. That which was unquestionably divine became human. The two natures were combined in that baby that was born in Bethlehem. God became man in Jesus. Romans 5 refers to him as the second Adam. And that's true because all that was true of the first Adam, the first man created, was found in Jesus. He had a human body. He was exposed to human weakness and fatigue and human suffering and, and sorrow and human temptation. Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet he was without sin. It tells us that he was made like his brethren in all things so that he could come to our aid. So his humanity meant so much more than just having a human body. You know, just like our humanity means more than just simply having physical bodies, so Jesus' humanity encompassed so much more than just taking on human form. The Word became flesh. He didn't just clothe himself with flesh. The divine and the human were united in Jesus, permanently, truly. Each nature fulfilled its part according to its proper laws. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. All right, so why am I stressing this so much? Is it really that important to belabor this point? I mean, after all, don't we just have to believe Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven? Well, according to the Bible, it is very important that you believe the right things about Jesus. John wrote about this in his epistles as well. If you look at uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, it says, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. And then the next book, 2 John, a little epistle he wrote, just one chapter, 2 John verse 7 of that chapter says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So do you see that it is rather important that we believe that Jesus was a man, that he actually came in the flesh? Now let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, which says, Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. Skipping over to chapter 4, verse 14 of 1 John. It says, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And then also chapter 5, verse 5 of 1 John. It says, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So you also see how important it is that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The divine word spoken by God as the only way to our salvation. It's not just that the word dwelt among us. It's not just that the flesh dwelt among us. It's the word become flesh. God and man preserved side by side in one being. That is what holds the answer to our lost condition as sinful humanity. And John's warnings apply to us today because there are so many modern cults and religions that will use Jesus as the object of their faith. They'll tell you, we believe in Jesus, but when it comes down to believing the right things about Jesus, they just don't. 
They don't follow the scriptures. They don't really believe that Jesus is God or that he actually was a man. And the Bible is clear about what that says about them. They're liars. They're deceivers. They're not born of God. They're not saved from their sins. They're not going to heaven. So yes, it is important to realize that the baby that we honor this season was a very special baby. It was the Word become flesh. It was God become man. The Christmas message does not stop there, though. Not only did the Word become flesh, but it dwelt among us. He made his dwelling among us. If we were to translate that phrase as literally as possible, it would read, he tabernacled among us. The same word for tabernacle is that word for, for dwelling. That's kind of awkward in English, so we don't uh, use it that way. But that's what the word really means. And you remember that the tabernacle was the tent that was set up when the Jews were wandering in the wilderness. They had no home, they had no temple, but the tabernacle was to temporarily take the place of the temple as the place where God would dwell with them and where worship and sacrifice could take place. And so when Jesus was born as a baby, the whole world became the tabernacle of God. God's presence was physically experienced. He came to earth. Also, there was a physical reality that man could now offer his worship and his sacrifice to. That's why the wise men went, so that they could worship the newborn king. There was a mutual identification that took place. God identified with man. He became one of us. We're going to sing about that tonight. Please come hear about that. He dwelt among us. But man also is now able to identify with God because we have seen his glory. Now granted, we don't usually think of Jesus' birth or even his life on earth as being all that glorified. It was such a humble birth in a stable. It was a, a rather meager life as a, a simple carpenter's family. It certainly did not seem worthy of God who became man. But there was a reason for that. It was spiritual obedience that the father wanted from his son, not a, a mandatory submission to royal authority. And that's exactly what he wants from each of us. That's why he gave us the freedom to choose between sin and purity. And all of us chose sin. We've chosen to reject his purity. And so that is why Jesus came to earth as a man, but also as a servant, to show us the way back to him. But even as a servant, even as a pitiful baby born in an animal stall and, and laid to sleep in a trough, the glory of God could not be hidden. And that's why we like the Matthew and Luke's accounts of the Christmas story so much, because even in the humble surroundings of Christ's birth, they let us know that we beheld his glory glory that could not be concealed by a multitude of angels, even if it was just to a group of shepherds on a hillside. Glory that could not help but be revealed in the wondrous star in the heavens, even if it was only noticed by several oriental scientists. Throughout the life of Jesus, his glory was beheld. It could not be concealed even though Jesus asked witnesses to keep silent when he performed various miracles, or when he was transfigured in glory on that mountain with his three disciples. He told them not to tell anyone about that. But still, it was beheld. It could not be concealed. This man was God. Our God was man. And the glory of his deity was revealed in many ways. The, the humility of him becoming man was also shown when he took our sins all the way to the cross. The flesh that the Word had become was flesh that was bruised and wounded and sacrificed so that all of our flesh could be saved. But that flesh was raised again in glory. That body of Jesus, that physical body, actually was raised from the dead. It's not just a metaphor. It's not just a, a symbol. Jesus' dead body was raised again. His flesh came to life again. And the glory of the Word was once again beheld. Glorious from the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And you can behold that truth today. The fact that those two concepts of, of grace and truth can coincide, that's actually symbolic of the coinciding of Christ's divinity and his humanity. Now think about that. Grace is God's unmerited favor toward us. It's bestowed on us when he chooses to forgive us of our sins and, and to wipe our slate clean. That is solely a divine act. It's something only God can do. Now, truth, on the other hand, is God's uncompromising justice, which he conducted when all the punishment of all of our sins was laid on Jesus' shoulders. 
that act was dependent on his humanness. If Jesus wasn't a man, then he couldn't have died for our sins. If he wasn't God, he couldn't have forgiven us of our sins. So his grace and his truth are displayed for us in his deity and his humanity. Jesus is God and man. And that's why Christmas is so special, because that's when it happened. Even as a baby in the manger, Jesus was God. Even as he was bleeding on the cross, Jesus was God. And when he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, he still is God. And all we can do is just bow down and worship him. We may never understand it fully, but we can believe it with all of our hearts. That There's a mystery to this doctrine of the Incarnation, but it's a holy mystery and one that becomes greater every time a little piece of it unravels in our mind. Words to a song called, To the Mystery, reveal the tremendous truth and the paradox of our God who became man. Allow me to close this morning with that. It says, When the Father longed to show a love he wanted us to know, he sent his only Son and so became a holy embryo. That is the mystery, more than you can see. Give up on your pondering and fall down on your knees. No fiction as fantastic and wild a mother made by her own child. The hopeless babe who cried was God incarnate and man deified. Because the fall did devastate, Creator must now recreate. And so to take our sin was made like us so we could be like Him. That is the mystery, more than you can see. Give up on your pondering and fall down on your knees.